So these notions up at the top are subjective. And these notions down here are objective. Okay. Well, those are notions that get tossed around a lot, objective, subjective. And we're not always explicit about what we mean. Here's what I mean. A statement is subjective, or an issue is subjective, just in case whether or not it's true depends on what people believe about it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, objective features are things that are true or false independently of what anybody believes about them. Now, most things, by this definition, are clearly going to count as objective. The world is round. That seems to be objective. It doesn't seem to depend on what anyone believes about it. And even if there were a time when lots of people believed the Earth to be flat, well, that hardly shows the question of the Earth's shape to be a subjective matter. Because presumably, when these people did believe that the Earth was flat, nevertheless, the Earth was in fact round, and they were just mistaken. Okay. Now, <clears throat> lots of people think that morality is a realm where there's only room for subjective opinion and belief, and no room for objective statements or claims to be true. Um, lots of philosophers think that that's a mistake. Okay. <clears throat> now, we don't need to get into this issue here. This is really a matter for ethical philosophy. But observe a couple things. First, the fact that there's a lot of disagreement in moral cases doesn't show that there's no fact of the matter. In fact, one might suppose that just because we do disagree, there must be something for us to disagree about. Okay. And that something might very well be a statement of truth about objective morality itself. Okay. okay, so much for subjectivity and objectivity. I'm going to turn now to the critical notion of argument. Argument. Let's write it down. This is in many ways a very central notion in philosophy and certainly in our class of critical reasoning. Now, <clears throat> let's begin by talking about what an argument is, by talking about what it's made up of. Okay? Well, an argument is an attempt to prove some claim or other. Okay? And the argument is made up out of two parts. First, there's a set of starting assumptions or premises. And the idea is that these premises are supposed to lend support to or make plausible or perhaps even prove beyond a doubt that some other claim is true, and this privileged claim is called the conclusion. And so an argument is really about a claim to the effect that these premises here, this set of sentences, somehow give us reason to believe that this conclusion is true. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if the premises are going to do their job of giving us support, well, they better be two things. First, they better be true.
if someone is really trying to give me a reason to believe this conclusion, well, he better give me premises that are true. Otherwise, I can just call him out on that very point. I can say, look, these premises don't give me a reason to believe this conclusion because these premises that you give me aren't even true. But of course, the other thing that premises need to be is relevant. There are lots of true statements we can stick in here to try to give support for some, tr some conclusion that we want our hearers to believe. But of course, they can't just be anything. They have to be somehow related to the statement that we're making in the conclusion. And so here are obviously the two critical criteria for good premises. Truth and relevance. Now, <clears throat> I want at this point to remind you that this critical word argument has many other uses in English. Um, it can often mean a kind of verbal fight. Mom and dad had an argument last night. It can mean the value of uh, uh, the input of a function. Okay, so a function takes this thing as argument. Um, there are many other uses of the term. They're all equally valid, of course. But in this context, and in this class, when I mean argument, when I say the word argument, I'm going to mean this. I'm going to mean uh, a certain set of claims or premises that are purport to prove or give credence to or make more plausible the truth of some other claim which is called the conclusion. Now, <clears throat> it's also good to point out at this point that even though arguments are often very good things to have, um, they aren't always required. Okay? And so if you're trying to wonder about the truth of something, well, arguments are not always what you need. Okay? So, for example, if you stand in the middle of a road and you see a bus-like object barreling down on you, and you ask yourself whether you ought to believe, in fact, that there is a bus barreling down on you, well, probably at that moment, the last thing you should be doing is trying to come up with an argument to prove that there is, in fact, a bus barreling down on you. Very often, uh, <clears throat> you can, at that point, trust your senses. You can uh, make a decision quickly because, in this particular case, making a decision and acting is more important than trying to come up with a way to be absolutely certain about the thing that you want to believe. But in many contexts, in many non-extraordinary contexts, what we want is an argument. When we're wondering about what we ought to believe, when we're trying to convince people that they ought to believe something else, uh, what we need to give them is an argument. Okay? That's the whole value of arguments. Arguments are supposed to be encapsulations of reasons to believe something. And reasons are, of course, at the heart of our notion of rationality. Same root in Latin. Okay, well, we've arrived at our first notion now of cognitive bias. And so that's what I'm going to spend the next lecture talking about. So I'll see you then.